Welcome everybody to Pre-Health Shadowing, a virtual shadowing platform for pre-health students during the COVID-19 pandemic. Go ahead and drop in the chat where you are Zooming from. This is a program that strives to be flexible and accessible, and that allows students from not only just the US, but all over the world to join us. And so this is really exciting to see where all of our students are coming from. Great, that's awesome. Welcome everybody. So a couple updates before we begin. Um, if you are not receiving emails from pre-health shadowing, there's a couple things that you can do to never miss a virtual shadowing session. We do um, send out a weekly email with all of the session times and Zoom links and the link to register for the session. So if you would like to receive this, make sure that you are signed up by going to this link at the bottom left, www.prehealthshadowing.com slash join us. And this will ensure that you are signed up for email. The next step after that will be going to your email and spotlight searching pre-health shadowing. When you do that, you might have to check in your junk, you might have to check in your spam. Once you find the pre-health shadowing emails, go ahead and mark our emails as important. This will tell your email that you wanna send it directly to the inbox rather than going to a different um, file. Another thing you can do is save pre-health shadowing as a contact and this will ensure that it again goes to your inbox. So if you do both of those things, as well as make sure that you are signed up for emails, you should be getting constant notifications for our virtual shadowing sessions to stay updated and never miss a session. An update is that our website has been going um, errors and been crashing recently. This is due to the large influx of students that we've received. So we are so grateful that you guys are using our platform um, for your benefit and um, learning from our professionals. Uh, some things that you can do to help out is to pull out your phone and scan this QR code. You can also use this link. This is the GoFundMe for Pre-Health Shadowing. Pre-Health Shadowing is a nonprofit student-led organization that um, survive solely on donations. So we really are looking for help from our students to keep this program afloat. We have vowed to keep pre-health shadowing accessible and flexible for all students, which means we will record every session and make it available to anybody who is unable to attend the session due to any reason. We also vow to keep it 100% free for students so that anybody who's interested can join. I encourage you all, if you are financially able, to donate $1, $5, maybe $10, and share this with others. We appreciate anything you guys can help out with. Thank you so much. Another announcement, if you are joining us in our live session today, go ahead and post that you are here and tag pre-health shadowing. This will give you the chance to get reposted onto our official page. So at pre-health shadowing on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and at pre-health shadow on Twitter. Students can take a post-shadowing assessment to receive verified virtual shadowing hours. And you guys um, will need to take good notes, so ensure that you have the proper materials to take notes because the assessment will be 10 questions. It's not meant to be difficult, it's just meant to show that you were paying attention throughout the duration of the session. Um, when, for those of you who are applying to programs right now, you are allowed to put pre-health shadowing as an activity or clinical experience. However, you must be sure that you um, explicitly state that these are virtual shadowing hours. So you can still put them on your application, but it's not to be confused with in-person shadowing. And throughout this session today, feel free to drop your questions or comments into the chat and our team members will be sure to ask them during the Q&A portion of today's session. If you guys have any questions, you guys can go ahead and drop them in the chat for us as well, anything about PHS, and we'll be sure to get back to you. So without further ado, I would love to welcome you our speaker for today, Dr. Matthew Wiseman. Welcome. Excellent, thank you, Nina. Thank you, Pre-Health Shadowing. 
uh, for inviting me. Let's see. Uh-oh, we got to enable screen sharing for me, please. Sorry about that. Go ahead and try again. Uh, let's see. I think it's this one, and I think I can make it that, and I think I can look at my notes. So can everybody see my slides and not my notes, right? Yes. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you for having me. I, you know, uh, I'm excited to be here, and I'm I'm talking today, you know, in this focusing a little bit on this common device that they use in improv comedy, which is something I don't really get to use enough in my professional life and something that my family thinks I maybe use too much in my personal life. And it's this whole idea of like, yes, and, you know, where an audience member or a fellow improviser is supposed to introduce a subject and whatever they say, instead of dismissing that subject, however outlandish it is, that improviser is supposed to take the subject and build upon it to find what works and to add to it. And I sort of feel like that's been somewhere like a guiding principle of my educational and my professional path. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm delighted to join you today and to talk a little bit about my professional journey so far. And then upon reflecting back, I think some of the choices I made and and didn't make really open my eyes to opportunities I might never have known existed. So I'm right now on the site chair for the Department of Medicine at Mount Sinai Beth Israel in downtown here in New York, um, which puts me in charge of the quality of care and education and research of our hundreds of faculty and trainees. And I get to combine those administrative responsibilities and a bunch of clinical responsibilities by seeing my own primary care patients a couple of afternoons a week. And I uh, work closely with medical students and do some research and publishing on topics related to kind of innovative outpatient healthcare delivery and specifically in the areas of equity, efficiency and technology. And I'm gonna try to look at my notes and the chat and my slides and keep everything uh, moving along. So even though I grew up in Boston, and even though I'm a diehard Red Sox fan, I always like this quote by Yankee great Yogi Berra, tough to be a Red Sox fan in New York. Um, my hope today is to share with you some of the choices that I've made to get to the place I am today. Um, and it's, it's based sort of on this quote, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. And throughout my trajectory, I found ways to build upon what sometimes seems like a choice between two options and to try to take that third and option to leave your options open and to explore knowing that most doors through which you walk are what we like to talk about is two way doors, not one way. So rarely is a decision irreversible, um, and, you know, and so worth trying some of these things out. So. I'm going to walk you through the sort of yes ands of my education, my training, the institutions, the positions I've held, and we'll leave tons of times for questions and answers. And Nina, if, if we can, I think we had a poll question just sort of about where people are and what they're doing. Maybe this is a good time to throw that up here and we'll give people 30 seconds or something to tell me, um, you know, what describes where you are now, what you're thinking about doing in the future. Um, and just to sort of set the stage about whether you've ever thought about a second degree, you know, not that life isn't busy enough. Um, so if people can answer that, and obviously if there's more to add, you're welcome to put it in the chat. I'm not gonna answer, and Nina, if you can throw up the results. Yes, all right. We have 90% have voted. Wow. Go ahead and share that. Awesome. That's great. So mostly college students, mostly people applying to med school and wow, 56% thinking about getting master's degrees in addition to their clinical degrees. That's great. Um, and so we'll, we'll cover a lot of that as we move on. So uh, let's see, let's click over there. Um, So I went to a lot of school, right? I mean, becoming a doctor requires at least four years of college four years of medical school, and in my case, four years of residency after medical school. And as an undergrad, unlike a lot of pre-medical students who chose to pursue biology or chemistry or other lab sciences, I ended up majoring in economics, which um, meant a lot of requirements to graduate and not a lot of electives. Um, 
but you know, but it really let me take classes that I was genuinely interested in uh, and to build a strong analytical foundation and to meet classmates from a broad range of backgrounds where I was often the only aspiring doctor in the crowd, um, which was a nice change from what lay ahead later in medical school and residency and in my career. And you know, it was a nice way to meet people who were sort of in adjacent fields, but not really in medicine. And so I ended up writing a thesis that, you know, yes, and combined my passion for healthcare and my study of economics by exploring the impact of for-profit ownership of hospitals on the prices that were charged uh, to the insurance companies by the hospitals. At some point, I could talk about this for hours. I won't bore you with the details today. But, but the point was that even before starting medical school, to really try to find ways for me to understand the industry and sort of the, how, the, how the whole healthcare system fit together. When I chose economics in, in college, I really thought that would be my last chance to study anything that wasn't biology. And part of what made me think I didn't need to to major in biology was I figured, oh, you know, I'll get tons of that later on. I'd rather learn something that was something I wasn't going to be exposed to. And then a couple of years later, as I was actually applying to medical school, I discovered what was then a pretty new idea, although now a much more prevalent option, which is a combined MD MBA program, which enabled me to get all of the required coursework from medical school in those same four years while also getting a degree in healthcare management, which in my case was really mostly over the summer and on the weekends. So most schools with MD MBA programs have a five-year option, you know, that sort of traditional, traditional uh, med school pathway, and, and obviously there are exceptions to this all over the place. The traditional med school student pathway is that the first two years of medical school are sort of book learning and very preclinical. And then the second two years, the third and fourth years of medical school are clinical, where you spend most of the time rotating in hospitals and on the wards and in outpatient practices. And the vast majority of MD, MBA programs insert a business year, a, an accelerated business degree in between the second and third years. Um, there are lots of advantages to that. You can focus on medical school during the medical school years, and you can focus on business during the business school year. There's a big social disadvantage, which is that then when you hit the wards in third year, you're with a bunch of medical students you've really never met before because the rest of your class cohort are all a year ahead. At Thompson, at a handful of programs across the country, there is a four-year, it's a four-year program. And so we started business school even before I finished college. Um, and worked through the evenings and the weekends and the summers and tried to um, pack it all in so that we could stay with our cohort and graduate in the same four years. It was a fascinating program. And, and what's great about it, we actually just a few weeks ago celebrated the 25th anniversary of, of that program's existence. It's one of the oldest and one of the very few four-year programs in the country. And we really built a tremendous uh, bond among the 15 or so people in my year in that combined program. And we're still very much in touch. We see each other socially, we collaborate academically, um, and it really turned into a great program. Obviously, that's not the only program in the country. This this article that I that I flagged here out of the Atlantic from about six years ago is a really interesting summary of how the MBA has flourished for doctors and really not just for doctors. I know a lot of NP MBAs and there's actually a whole DNP business world that, that we could talk about in the Q&A that's separate. There are lots of PA MBAs. Um, and and there, I think there are like 67 schools or something that offered now, which include you know private schools, but also a bunch of the UC programs offer MBAs. So lots of lots of options and lots of flexibilities. So then, you know, after medical school comes residency. And in my case, it was hard to decide. Here's a, this is supposed to be a comical uh, look at picking specialties. This is from an article in the British Medical Journal about 15 years ago. You know, 
Are you nice? Do you hate adults? Do you want your patients dead? Are you afraid of the dark? Blah, blah, blah. And it helps you pick a specialty that way. They're kidding. There are lots of ways to pick specialties. One theory is based on which bodily fluid can you tolerate the best? And you know, maybe you want to go into gastroenterology if you can handle stool. Maybe you go into pediatrics if you don't mind kids peeing on you, et cetera. And, and there's also a theory that I often tell people where you, you sort of work with, you work in that um, area and figure out whether the, the sort of culture of that area fits, whether the colleagues are people you think you can work with, whether the lifestyle fits in with what you want to do. I went through third year of medical school where, you know, you rotate and see all kinds of different specialties. And I really liked everything or almost everything. And so in that sort of yes and philosophy, um, I ended up in this combined, or I chose this combined internal medicine and pediatrics uh, dual residency. I really liked, uh, I liked both internal medicine and pediatrics and didn't really want to give up on either of them. I liked the people I worked with. And, you know, it felt like a really growing field, both because people can do lots of different things after med peds, but also there's been a increased um, interest in the, in the sort of overlap diseases. And so I think about that both in terms of adult survivors of congenital disease. So for example, you know, there's new treatments for cystic fibrosis and people are living longer and longer. There's lots of surgical solutions for uh, congenital heart disease. There's treat, you know, there's uh, much more supportive care for Down syndrome. And so people who used to die at age six or 12 or 15 are now living into their 40s and 50s. And it's clearly hard for them to keep seeing their pediatrician who isn't used to taking care of 45 year olds. And it's often hard for them to see an internist who's generally not experienced with uh, taking care of those congenital diseases. And so MedPeds is a great fit for stuff like that. There are lots of diseases that were historically diseases of older ages. So things like obesity and uh, type two or adult onset diabetes. Uh, we don't call it adult onset anymore because it's happening more and more in younger and younger kids. And there are lots of other diseases that that sort of fit into this both kind of um, box. But at the same time, uh, training in both internal medicine and pediatrics means that you get to take both the internal medicine and the pediatrics boards at the end of training. And it means you could go into any sort of fellowship, any kind of post-residency training in either of those specialties. So some people do med-peds and they um, go on and uh, pursue a fellowship, you know, just in adult GI, for example, or just in peds GI, or some places will have a fellowship where you can get training in both. There are clearly some like GI where things tend to deviate a little more but there are some like adolescent medicine or, um, or allergy or endocrinology where there's much more overlap between the two diseases. Often, you know, even though MedPeds is actually an older specialty or an older combination of specialties, I guess, than family medicine, I often get why I, I often get asked why I picked family medicine, why I picked MedPeds over family medicine? And it's a great question. I think there are lots of reasons for either, and they're both, they're both really good choices. This chart shows a little bit about some of the differences. If I can shrink my notes. Um, so MedPeds is a four-year combined training program. Either medicine or PEDS would be three years. So instead of doing six, you sort of get it compressed down to four, but you're still eligible to sit for the boards in, in both specialties. Family medicine is a three-year residency program. And instead of taking either medicine or peds boards, you take specific family medicine boards. When this chart was made, um, MedPeds was about 36% outpatient medicine. Family medicine really focuses on, on outpatient and was about 50%. I think the trend in residency training in general 
is to increase the amount of time spent outpatient because more and more care is delivered outpatient. And so I suspect those numbers will grow over time. In, in MedPeds, we spend about 24 months in pediatric rotations and 24 months in medicine rotations. Family medicine, because they're spending so much time in the outpatient world, they're spending less time both in peds and in medicine. And so, so MedPeds folks feel like they have a kind of deeper um, knowledge around um, particularly sick pediatric patients. And, and because they spend more time in the ICU and CCU, more sick uh, adult patients, family medicine, by contrast, spends more time in in specialties like OB and GYN and general surgery and ophthalmology and, and really gets exposure to common ambulatory um, experiences in a lot of those subspecialties. When I was applying, there was this sense that family medicine was more of a West Coast phenomenon and that if I wanted to stay on the East Coast, uh, which I did, that MedPeds would be a better fit. Uh, you know, I think we could talk about that in the Q and A if if people are interested. But I think I, I've certainly, as a as an administrator, employed lots and lots of family medicine docs in in East Coast, great East Coast Coast jobs. Um, and I'm sure that on the West Coast, because of the MedPeds training, that people are eligible for lots of great positions out there. There is sometimes a challenge in MedPeds that you kind of have to explain what it is because everybody's heard of family medicine and not a lot of people have heard of MedPeds despite the fact that MedPeds is a, um, it's the largest of the combined residencies out there. So like, for example, there's an emergency medicine, internal medicine combination that's much, much smaller. Um, so, so that's sort of my background. I want to talk about what my job is now and what my days are like now a little bit, starting with the place where I am now, which is, uh, Mount Sinai, Beth Israel. So this was founded as Beth Israel Medical Center back in 1889, and it was really set up to serve a particular immigrant community on the Lower East Side that wasn't able to get care. Uh, elsewhere in New York. And, you know, more than a century later, 130 years later, it's still really retaining its commitment to treating groups that otherwise have been excluded from mainstream medical care. And that's really been true throughout its history. So in the, in the 70s and 80s, I think the focus was a lot on patients with chemical dependency. And we started the biggest and old, one of the oldest methadone programs in the country for treating heroin addiction, among others. In the 80s and 90s, we were one of the, like the forefront of HIV care. Um, more recently, um, a lot more around LGBT care here, and we have a, a, a big population of people of trans experience, and we do a lot of gender affirming surgery and have done that in a very integrated way. And so the goal is really to keep that community hospital feel and to treat this section of lower Manhattan in particular as if we were a community hospital. And at the same time, we've already always had this academic uh, sense. Um, and I work with a lot of very prolific researchers and publishers. About seven years ago, we merged with the larger Mount Sinai health system which itself was founded in 1855, again, to care for, for indigent Jews, mostly in upper Manhattan, uh, though it was, you know, it accepted emergency care for people of any religion, set up another sort of academic institution uptown that with which Beth Israel merged about seven years ago. And so, so we can maintain this community hospital feel, but in a, in a very academic environment. And I was in another place like that when I was in medical school up in Boston that had that same sort of vibe. And to me, it's kind of the best of both worlds to be able to provide real care to a real community while at the same time figuring out how to make the world a better place on a large scale. 
This is an ad on the left here is an ad from the Sunday New York Times about five years ago. Um, you know, New York is a funny place. And I think there were maybe a couple of New Yorkers I saw in the chat. But, you know, Manhattan's not that big. And people tend to only go a few blocks to go to the supermarket or to the deli or whatever. They really won't leave their like five block radius for a lot of stuff. Anything else is like too far away. And with this merger about seven years ago, it sort of felt like Mount Sinai was that same thing. So the ad says, you know, most New York neighborhoods have a deli, a dry cleaners, a Chinese restaurant, and a Mount Sinai. And that may be a hospital, it may be an outpatient practice, it may be a physical therapy practice, it may be a emergency, a urgent care practice. Um, but the goal is to have many doors to enter the, the greater Mount Sinai network, which now covers eight campuses in uh, Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and uh, and on the South shore of Long Island. That includes over 400 ambulatory practice locations with over 7,000 physicians, over 40,000 employees, and we're the largest or one of the largest uh, training programs in the country. And really that mission, which I think I've alluded to, right, is to, is to provide compassionate patient care with seamless coordination and to advance medicine through unrivaled education, research, and outreach in the many diverse communities we serve. Now, I've only been here about two, I, would, I trained at Sinai Uptown um, in Medpeds, as I think I mentioned, that was Mount Sinai. Um, and I've been back here at Beth Israel a couple of years, but for the last 15 or so years before coming back to Beth Israel, I was in a sort of different delivery system called the Federally Qualified Health Centers. Um, can you just give me a thumbs up, I guess, using your emoticons, if um, you ever heard of an FQHC? Man, I'm getting no thumbs up. Oh, one, I got one thumbs up, so good. Um, and one surprise face, I don't know what to make of that. Um, so. So, you know, that's not surprising to me. I went through medical school and residency and my first job after residency and had never heard of a federally qualified health center. And I happen to think it's a great way to deliver care. And so I wanted to talk about them as a model just for a couple of minutes. Um, so, so federally qualified health centers are a way of delivering care and some community health centers there are some other practices that um that go under this um nomenclature it's a specific it's weird because i would never heard of them many people on this call have never heard of them but they're everywhere there are thousands across the country including dozens right near the hospital where i train and it's a specific definition that the federal government gives. They're private organizations, nonprofit, that are located in areas of high need that's designated by the federal government as a medically underserved area. They have to provide a comprehensive set of services based on what the community needs. So that's not just medical and not just primary care, but it's often dental, vision, behavioral health, uh, care management, some medical specialties, you know, sometimes ID or HIV care, GI care, podiatry for people with diabetes, stuff like that. Fascinatingly, it has to have the board of directors, which at um, lots of healthcare organizations or hospitals is, um, you know, people who are active in the community, people who are successful business people, uh, you know, other uh, luminaries from the neighborhood. For federally qualified health centers, the majority, 51% of every health center's governing board have to be made up of actual patients in the health center, and they have to reflect the diversity of the patients in the health center. So that may have to include um, a patient who is undomiciled. It may have to include a patient who is HIV positive. It may have to include a patient of trans experience. Um, it has to include the geographic spread. And so it really, from a leadership point of view, as the former CMO of um, of a um, of a FQHC, it it really changes the way you think about delivering care and running the practice. 
and really focusing on what the patients need. And speaking about patients, that's the other the other issue here that, you know, regardless of insurance status, regardless of ability to pay, regardless of language skills or health literacy, there have to be opportunities for patients to come and be seen. So that, you know, that all ties in with the history of FQHCs. They started, um, they came out of this movement in the 1960s. Jack Geiger, who was a doctor and an activist, uh, started the first two in my uh, hometown of Boston. Here's a, this is a billboard from Boston. And then also in Mount Bayou, Mississippi. And, you know, from a sort of yes and perspective, it's FQHCs have always sort of crossed a lot of the historic barriers. They're, they tend to be the source of care in urban areas, um, urban, mostly blue state um, areas, and also in uh, rural areas in what are, you know, what are sort of seen as red states. It started with LBJ and the war on poverty. Senator Kennedy, uh, you know, a Democrat was the leading force for FQHCs for a long time. Um, but George Bush, a Republican, had doubled United States financing for FQHCs and led to a huge expansion in FQHCs about 15 years ago. So, so it's really a delivery system that, that has fit in across a lot of barriers and takes care of a lot of people. So overall, um, you know, one in 12 people in the US are served by FQHCs, one in 10 children, one in six people receiving Medicaid, one in three individuals below living below the poverty line. So it really does cover a lot of ground. All right, I'm gonna take a quick sip before we move on to the next slide. So I wanted to look at what my roles have been. I mean, I think my, I, you know, my sort of identity is um, tied up in being a primary care doctor. Can we get thumbs up for people who have primary care doctors? I just want to get a sense. Like I, every day I, I see people who like haven't been to the doctor in a long time. All right, there's a couple of thumbs ups, thumbs up. Excellent. So, I mean, I think primary care is great. It's, you know, it enables you to have real relationships with people over time, longitudinal relationships, and to take care of huge problems, you know, diagnosing people with cancer and HIV and all kinds of stuff. And also, you know, very small problems. Um, dealing with, you know, sort of the day-to-day -day people getting through life, dealing with things that are fixed with medicines, dealing with things that are fixed with, you um, psychosocial care, and <laughs> helping to coordinate um, care in multidisciplinary teams. And so working with NPs and PAs and social workers and case managers and other specialties, and, and really trying to figure out how to bring that focus back to the patient and what the patient needs, which obviously is different for everybody, but it's tied in with a lot of those same uh, unifying things around making sure people have, you know, the right diagnosis, get the right treatment and get the right support to get taken care of. Because, you know, they're only in my office for 15 minutes every few months mostly, but their ability to solve their issues or carry on with their life, you know, takes place for hours and days and weeks and months in between seeing me and making sure they have the support to do that is really important. The role of primary care has changed over time and, and it's expanded and you know, it also varies depending on what kind of practice you're in and what part of the country you're in. But you know, my view of primary care involves a lot of mental health care. I spend a lot of time dealing with depression and anxiety, for example, a lot of infectious diseases that we take care of, hepatitis C and HIV, which used to be the purview of infectious disease docs really has rolled into primary care and a lot of practices um, and HIV prevention, you know, giving uh, post-exposure prophylaxis and pre-exposure prophylaxis PEP and PrEP 
which are HIV medicines for HIV negative people to help prevent them from getting HIV is a big piece that fits in with a lot of the preventive medicine work that we do. Uh, women's health, for example, pap smears and contraception, I spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, one of the things I've gotten into recently, which is one of the more fulfilling things that I've done recently is, is medication assisted therapy for people with substance abuse. And you can really watch somebody who comes into my office in withdrawal, get their first dose of Suboxone, of buprenorphine, and perk up and become a totally different person just in their time in the waiting room. So primary care is ever evolving. It's a fascinating field to be in and, um, and is well supported here um, in, ooh, good telemedicine question. I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, you know, well supported here at uh, at Beth Israel, we actually just renovated a whole floor of our ambulatory care building. And that's what this door is showing. And we put all of the medicine subspecialties on one floor and primary care is right at the corner um, at sort of the nexus of all the care we provide. And it enables me to walk down the halls and see my subspecialist colleagues and get impromptu consults on a lot of things that, um, that you know, I have questions about and enables them to walk patients over who are getting sort of fra fragmented care from different subspecialists and make sure that they have a primary care home to unify all that, all of that. Now, that's my role as primary care doctor. As, as chair of medicine, my role is really to make sure on the inpatient side that things are are flowing well, but as the world is transitioning more to outpatient medicine, making sure that we're really providing good care and efficient care and equitable care on the outpatient side. And this is another Mount Sinai ad from that same series that's been ringing in my head for years. You know, it says, if our beds are filled, it means we've failed. And it really focuses on all of that. It focuses on how do we make sure that we're doing so much in the outpatient space that we're using our case management wisely, that we're treating as much as we can, that we're keeping people out of the emergency room and out of the inpatient beds by really maximizing all of their outpatient resources. It's something that New York State about seven years ago now got an $8 billion grant from the federal government to try to reduce inpatient and emergency room utilization for patients. And it's something we do on a daily basis. Even when I'm not in the office, I'm trying to manage stuff to make sure that our patients are getting the care they need. And then we try to put in systems so that, um, so that patients can get taken care of without the sort of traditional like, well, if you need a, you know, you have a question, come make an appointment and come in and be seen and we'll see if we can take care of you. Because that that's not really how people live and it's not really what patients need in 2021 and beyond. Of course, you know, during our first COVID surge in New York back in March and April, our beds got more than filled. Um, and now as we're seeing a, you know, a little bit of an upswing now, we're really trying to figure out how are we taking care of all those patients and how can we keep patients out of the hospital? As we're thinking through what we need to do, I often come back to this Don Berwick article from uh, 2017 from JAMA. And Don Berwick is a pediatrician by training. He ran CMS for the feds a few years ago. And he starts this article off by telling this story about a business school professor who was like doing a sabbatical and she was visiting um, some other university during her sabbatical. And every day when she went to this school, she was uh, you know, spending her sabbatical at, she had to sign her name into this uh, book because she came to work by bicycle. And every day she would ride her bike to the university and she would sign in uh, to the book. And she asked one day, like, why do you care that I signed in by, that I came in by bicycle and I signed in this book? And the people at the front desk had no idea. And 
In fact, they pointed her to these boxes and boxes of old sign-in ledgers that they had been storing behind the front desk for decades. So, you know, being a good academician, she investigated. And it turned out that it goes way back to World War II that fuel was being rationed because of all the shortages for the war effort. And anybody who commuted by bicycle could sign into the book and get like a food coupon to get a free lunch to reward them for not having used gas to come to work. The war ends, the food rations, uh, the fuel rations end, the food benefit ends, but the bicycle book remains because nobody ever sort of took a step back to investigate you know, whether this was something that needed to continue or not. And so in this article, Berwick asks, if you could break or change any rule in service of a better care experience for patients or staff, what would it be? And I try to use that as a real call to action all the time to think about as we're going through our day and we're doing all this stuff and some of it just seems so minutia filled or so bureaucratic, like some of the stuff we have to do because there are regulations or there's a patient safety issue, but some of it is just there because it's been there. And how do we figure out um, what those things are and how do we eliminate them? And it ties in, you may have heard of the, the idea of the triple aim, that we should be trying to provide care that's got better outcomes at a lower cost and with improved patient experience. And, and over the last few years, there's been increasing talk of, yes, those that triple aim is important, but the key to avoiding burnout and having clinicians operate at the top of their license and be, um, productive and successful and have and create a good patient experience is to have an improved clinician experience as well. And so we've spent a lot of time and this talk, I didn't, I didn't go into some of the specifics, but at, at Beth Israel and at, at Community Healthcare Network and some of the other patient, patient other places that I've worked, we've really tried to focus on every step for the patient experience and the clinician experience and the staff experience. You know, what are things like when you walk in the door and, and how can we get rid of some of those hiccups that make the whole process of care smoother? COVID for better or worse has forced us to relook at a bunch of those processes. We've added on processes and we've, we've shaved away processes and we've tried to figure out um, what, you know, what we really need to optimize around to make it a better place. So somebody just asked about telemedicine and, and I had actually included this slide. Um, so um, way before the pandemic back in February, even before February, we've been trying to increase the use of telemedicine at uh, Beth Israel and at the other Sinai hospitals. And I got a lot of pushback from doctors. Um, I gave a grand rounds lecture um, back at the beginning of 2020, and somebody actually stood up in the back of the room and said that I was killing the physical exam, I was killing primary care, and that like advocating for telemedicine was like a horrible crime that I was committing. And we ended up writing this paper because we heard a lot of the same complaints over and over. My patients aren't ready. My doctors aren't ready. My patients are too sick. Um, you're going to ruin the, the patient doctor or patient provider relationship. Patients didn't want it. I was forcing this on the doctors. I was forcing it on the patients. Gets in the way of traditional workflow. I'll increase my malpractice risk. I won't get paid for it. Um, it'll treat Medicaid patients and commercial patients differently. And so we spent a lot of time trying to calm doctors down. And, you know, it was going okay. We wrote this paper about some of our successes. But, um, Frankly, it took a pandemic. So this got published in, in February, in March, the pandemic hit New York. And all of a sudden, everybody who told me I was crazy was coming to my office to ask me how they could get signed up for this telemedicine thing. 
and you know every piece of change, you know, change management is its own field of study and you know every change management thing you don't get a pandemic or you don't have to deal with a pandemic to um to get changed there are lots of other strategies and lots of other things we have to think about and there's lots of other stuff by telemedicine that we're trying to do to um to make healthcare and outpatient healthcare run more smoothly so telemedicine you know we've now adopted we're back to <laughs> we went from in february when this article was published we were at 97 percent in-person visits three percent telemedicine visits in March and April during the peak of the uh, pandemic, we were sort of flip-flopped. We were about 90% telemedicine and 10% video. In um, September and October, now it's like maybe 60, 40 or 70, 30. So we're still mostly in person and patients seem to wanna come in person, but we've definitely increased the amount of telemedicine visit that we're doing. And I think for the better, I mean, there are clearly patients who don't need to come into the office. There are patients we don't want to come into the office either because we don't want them to be exposed to infections that are here. We don't want them to expose patients that are here. The commute is worse than the visit, you know, all kinds of reasons that we can talk about later. But clearly video visits are, I think clearly, are here to stay and are a big piece of our, our business moving forward. We also spend a lot of time thinking about e-consults. So you don't even need a video visit sometimes with a specialist. If I, as the primary care doctor, have a question, instead of saying, you know, I, I'm getting stuck managing your diabetes, go see the endocrinologist. A lot of times that's not the right answer. You know, it takes a month to get an appointment with the endocrinologist. The patient has to take another day off of work. They have to get babysitting. They have to pay another subway fare or parking fee. They have to go, and then lots of times they go to the endocrinologist. We haven't done all the right tests. The endocrinologist repeats another test, says come back in a month. And so it's like two or three months later by the time they get on their right trajectory to care. If I can send an e-consult, if I can send an asynchronous but formalized message through the EMR, although there are lots of other ways to do it, but we do it through the EMR, to the specialist and I say, look, you know, I've tried these medicines, it's not working, what do you recommend? The specialist can um, the specialist can weigh in, can offer us advice. And often the next day I can get back to the patient and say, um, here's, you know, I talked it over with a diabetes expert, here's what they recommended. And by the next day or the day after, we can have an answer for the for the patient without them going anywhere, paying another major, you know, in-office copay, without taking time off work, getting a babysitter, all that other stuff. Depending on the specialty, somewhere between like 60 and 80 percent of the time, the specialists feel like the patient doesn't need to come in. And even when they do need to come in, we can um, we can help that in-person visit by doing a bunch of testing or getting the patient ready, doing stuff to kind of maximize that first visit with the specialist. There's lots of other stuff we're doing around how we book, how we try to reduce no-shows, how we help coordinate in between visits, planning pre-visit. That's a whole lecture in and of itself. Um, you'll just have to trust me that we're, we're working around a lot of those things. And it's, you know, part of what, what gets me excited about coming to work is, um, you know, is trying to figure out how we can make that healthcare delivery stuff better. And then to talk about how we're doing, um, you know, what these things are. And some of that is through publishing papers like this. We present at a bajillion conferences. I get to lecture at things like pre-health shadowing and talk about, you know, what, what things are out there. We do a lot of stuff on social media and we're trying to bring this sort of same scientific analysis to our social media use and what stuff actually appeals to people, where, you know, how do you get the right messages to the right people, how do you use social media effectively, both from a healthcare delivery point of view, from a patient education point of view, from a recruiting uh, med students and residents and fellows point of view. Um, and that's sort of like the next big thing that we're taking on. All right, I'm almost done. So, um, 
man, I talked about a lot of stuff today. I think, and you guys asked a lot of questions and I am um, looking forward to reading them and answering all these questions. Um, and Nina, I'm hoping that you're saving the chat also so that you know I can look at them after the fact and we can try to dissect what's working and what's not working. I think I think my lesson, you know, to a group that's predominantly um, in college and predominantly applying to medical school, and we can talk about all the other uh, cases in a minute. My advice is to sort of try out a bunch of stuff, to say yes and to a bunch of different things. Um, now in college, explore what you can explore, um, and, and this is the advice I give to third-year medical students. So put this in your long-term memory banks just for a moment um, that especially in fourth year medical school like lots of people um, decide in third year medical school that they're going to go do an internal medicine residency because they really want to be an interventional cardiologist and then in the fourth year of medical school they do a bunch of cardiology electives i think that's a horrible idea i think in fourth year of medical school you should do ophthalmology and dermatology and gynecology, because I know you're going to know cardiology when you come out of cardiology fellowship. But to be sort of a complete big picture thinking doctor, even if you're going to be an interventional cardiologist the rest of your life, I really think it's an important to have a sense of, you know, how other people think. And I feel that same way, you know, I felt that same way about being an economics major in college. I feel that same way about you know, what electives you do and how you sort of figure out what else is going on. And I think that normally leads people to um, to less common pathways. You know, MedPeds is a little bit unusual. MD, MBAs are a little bit unusual, but I'm always intrigued. We had a medical student rotating here a couple of weeks ago who was going into um, interventional radiology. It's a great field, but it's not the kind of thing that you really spend any time learning about in medical school. And so I asked how he discovered interventional radiology when it's not like on the core curriculum, you never sort of really talk about it. And he sort of, you know, had heard about it and said like, that's something I want to explore because that seems to fit with all the other things I want to do with my life. And so, um, you know, I encourage you to, um, to really figure out before saying yes to something in particular, to um, to figuring out what all the you know what all the choices are, um, I talk a lot about building a network, and that means a lot of different things. I mean, I think social media is great for that. LinkedIn, in particular, if you don't have a LinkedIn account, um, you know, in my world, that's how people get jobs and hire people and do consulting gigs and whatever. Instagram is great. We post a lot of stuff on Instagram. Twitter is fine, and we can talk about social media in a minute. Um, TikTok, I don't totally understand, but I'm trying. Um, but LinkedIn is where business right at this moment is happening. And so I encourage everybody um, to use LinkedIn to build a network. And and not just a virtual network, but you want a network of um, of mentors. And you know, rather than having a mentor who's got a particular point of view, it's really important to build like a a broad bench of of mentors who can really give you kind of um, contrasting or complementary views on what you want to do. Because a lot of times you ask people for advice and they tell you to do what they did. And that's fine, but I don't actually think you should do what I did, but I think you should listen to what I did and you know take away with that from you know some skills that might be useful to what you want to do. Um, and you know, after a whole 54 minutes that we've just spent talking about saying yes and, um, I, I do think it's important to know when to say no. And I think um, somebody um, mentioned that in the chat, like you got to have a life and you got to be able to do other stuff and, and you got to figure out which are the things um, to say no to, and that's probably a whole talk in and of itself, and it's different for every person. I think at the beginning, it's better to say yes to a bunch of things. And, you know, like if you're going to build a network of mentors, like I think it's great to have six mentors. And if you decide, you know what, three of them work out better than the other three, I don't think any anybody's going to be upset to say, if you say like, look, 
I'm really busy now. I don't think we have time to meet or can I follow up with you in a year when I've done, you know, had some more time to research. But if you don't cast a wide net at the beginning, um, it's much harder to sort of figure out um, how to do those things. You know, if you don't explore um, interventional radiology when you're a med student, it's much harder to end up there later on. And so, uh, you know, there is a, I'll leave you with sort of two parting thoughts before we turn to, um, to questions. Um, some famous business mentor once said that the key to strategy is not what you say yes to, it's what you say no to. And that's true. I think about that with my team here all the time. If we, if I say like, go do these 27 projects, they're not going to get any of them done. They're going to be all frazzled and, and feel burnt out. If we say like, look, here's 27 projects. Let's figure out like, which are the two that are the easiest to do? Which are the two that are the most important to do? Let's focus on those four. And then in a couple of months, we'll come back to the list and see if we're still picking the right four to start with. Sheryl Sandberg, many of you probably read Lean In. It's a great book. Um, and she talks about um, how sort of career evolution is, um, it's not a career ladder. It's more like a jungle gym. Like you're not always walking in one clear direction. You're moving over and sometimes moving down and back up and on the other side. And I like to have people have that as a vision so that, um, you know, this exploration doesn't necessarily take you away from whatever your goal is, but it, um, but it helps add to it. And you shouldn't feel like if you're not moving in like one narrow specific direction, um, there's some problem. What a wonderful presentation. Um, Are you ready to get started okay. with the Q&A? Ooh, I can't quite hear you. Let me just return this one text momentarily. Um, Students, for all of you, go ahead and drop your questions in the chat. We will be getting, beginning our Q&A portion shortly. All right, so thank you. So um, let's see, I'm gonna move all your faces over here. And Nina, you tell me, do you want me to go through, you want me to go through the chat? You want to pick them out and ask me? You tell yeah, me. Yeah, so um, Rosie and I will be your co-host for today. So we will orally be asking you um, specific questions from the chat. Students, if there's any questions um, that you are particularly interested that someone else asked, go ahead and do the little carrot. And that just gives us, um, this is more important. And so we will definitely try to get that question in. Our first question today is, uh, what does a day-to-day -day on your job look like as a med ped and um, what kind of stuff are you dealing with? Yeah, so I mean every day is different. So that's kind of what I like about it. Um, maybe I'll give you a I'll give you a sort of a sense of a week I think is probably a better answer to that. So um, so the easy piece is sort of my clinical piece. So I'm right now I have a job that's about 70 or 80 percent administrative and 20 percent clinical. So um, so I have two afternoons when I see patients and I see about uh, three patients an hour during that time. And then, you know, specialties are different in primary care. People don't only have issues those two sessions. And so. I spend a lot of time during the rest of the week answering people's, uh, you know, messages through the portal, phone calls, refill requests, um, stuff like that. Um, sorry, just dealing with a hospital issue that I wanted to make sure got taken care of. Um, so, um, so it's a little bit in flux, but. Um, but it's really two solid afternoons of primary care patients, which, as I mentioned, is, is everything, right? Serious, not serious, emergent, not emergent, um, all kinds of stuff. The rest of the week um, varies a lot. I think there are, you know, this week we're standing up a COVID vaccine um, center. And so a lot of my team's efforts is in... Um, you know, 
how do we do that? What space do we use? What nurses are giving the shots? What doctors are ordering the shots? How are we getting the medicine from the pharmacy? How are we getting the vaccines from the pharmacy to the floor? How long do we watch them for? How do we watch them somewhere where they're not gonna be too, you know, less than six feet away from somebody else? All that kind of stuff. So there are a lot of projects like that. I mean, that's obviously a right now project, but you know, every week there are two or three like specific operational right now kinds of projects that we've got to deal with. Then there's a bunch of big picture stuff. You know, we've got 12 outpatient practices. We've got an inpatient unit. We've got an intensive care unit. We need to make sure they're providing high quality care, that they're um, billing correctly, that they're seeing enough patients, that the phones are getting answered, that the, um, you know, doctors are, have the support they need to do their stuff. None of those is an emergency, but, but they're all on an ongoing basis working with the teams in those practices to figure out, you know, what the quality of care is like, what the finances are like, um, what the morale and culture are like. Um, and depending on the practice and the situation, you know, that turns into sort of different, um, you know, there are different specific challenges. Then there's like interfacing with the hospital leadership around, you know, making things work smoothly for them. Um, interfacing with the, in my last job, I did more of this, but working with the community directly, working with elected officials, working with the media, you know, there's like lots of opportunities to sort of figure out how to make our practices run well, and then how to, how to make sure we're meeting the needs of of the sort of larger community. And then, you know, we have trainees, we have residents and medical students and fellows. So making sure they're getting a good education, um, making sure we're right now we're in recruiting season. So making sure we're recruiting good uh, residents and fellows for next year. I don't know, there's probably some other stuff, but that's like a typical week. Thank you for that insight. So what a few key things stand out on a student's application that would increase their chances in getting into med school? So, I mean, I'll answer that, but with some caveats. I mean, I think, um, you know, I spend most of my time dealing with residency admissions and less time dealing specifically with um, med student um, applications. I mean, I think it's a mix. Um, you know, when I was in med school, most people were biology majors and had a very like clear path. Like you did biology, you got a certain score on a MCAT, you, you know, had like a lab experience during the summer and that was like your key to getting in. Um, I think fortunately now it's much more varied. I mean, there are lots more uh, college majors that people do. I think testing is important, but you know, I think people are able to see beyond testing to other experiences. I think it's important to know that you, it's important to show that you know what you're getting into. And I think programs like this are really useful for that. Um, medicine is hard and, um, and it's important that people are going into it for the right reasons, you know, not, um, you know, they have to, you have to sort of uh, be willing to um, sacrifice of yourself to a certain extent. And I think people have seen that in the COVID world. And so it's, it's maybe a little more apparent now, but I think to be able to say that, like, you're doing it and you understand the pros and the cons of it and you want to do it anyway, like that's, to me, that's a sort of compelling thing to say. And having had real life experience where you, you know, you sort of know what that means, I think is good. Thank you. So uh, would you say that majoring in economics made it more difficult for you to take the MCAT or get the material uh, that you need for prereqs for medical school? So uh, um, that's a good question. I mean, I, at the end of my college career, I think I only had one elective class by the time I fulfilled, there were 10 pre-med requirements. There were however many economics requirements and then there were a bunch of like core distribution requirements. So it certainly it certainly didn't make it easy um, to take all those courses. I think I probably did a little worse on the MCATs than somebody who 
um, than somebody who, um, oh shoot, I didn't put up, you know, we stopped slide sharing and I didn't put up my, um, sorry, my uh, sorry about that. handle and stuff. No, my, my fault. Um, we can, we can definitely yeah. re-enable it. My fault for not doing that. Um, so I can get a million more followers while I'm sitting here. Um, <laughs> so I, did I do worse in, on the MCATs than somebody who was like a biochemistry major? Maybe. Um, and you know, there are trade-offs in everything. I think in some ways I was a more interesting medical school interview, um, because I had done economics and I had stuff to talk about outside of sort of the, what was the usual at that time. But, uh, but I'm not saying you should, you know, major in economics to be interesting, or you should major in biochemistry to do, you know, get four extra points on the MCAT. I think you have to do stuff that's interesting to you and that ties in with um, where you want to be. And I think my message is really to think broadly about what that looks like. And maybe to try and fail a bunch of things before you settle on what that should be. Thank you. So could you speak more on what way is it like treating your first patient? Um, so, I mean, it depends, I guess, what you mean by my first patient. Like I remember my first day in um, physical diagnosis class as a second year medical student. And I like almost, I, you know, there was nothing like particularly scary going on, but like the room was hot and there were a lot of people there and like she was sick and um, I thought I was gonna like pass out um, from what was really like honestly a sort of benign interaction. Um, then I remember, so maybe that was an interviewing class. And then, then there was physical diagnosis class where they send you into a room for, um, for an hour basically to do like a whole history and physical on a patient in the hospital. And I remember like I tried to take my blood pressure cuff out of the bag and like all the parts went um, like flying all over the place. And, and I was so embarrassed and, and whatever. And the patient like totally laughed it off and made me feel comfortable. And I think, you know, that those moments sort of remind you that like we're all human and everybody's everybody's in the bed sometimes and you know we're lucky to be helping people and uh, you know you have to have that sort of like human connection um to get through the day and so then you know so those were sort of critical uh, inflection points i think my first patient is a resident um I guess my first patient is like a third year medical student on the wards where somebody was coming to me with questions that I couldn't answer. My first patient as a intern when they were like, Dr. Weissman, you know, the nurses are calling me and I need to like write orders and, and give direction was a momentous occasion. And then, you know, your first patient, when you come out of uh, training and you're looking around for somebody to ask questions and there is nobody, you're like, it um, is also a weird inflection point. And, I think at all those moments, you know, it's important to remember that there really are other people out there and there are people who've gone through this a million times. And there are people to ask and and you're never really alone. And so, I mean, I'm assuming one of the questions is going to be on burnout, but I, to me, that's like one of the reassuring things is to like think through all the other people you can sort of ask at any, um, at any moment when you really have something, you know, lots of other people are going through the same stuff. Thank you. Vivian in the chat says, I'm a biology major because I genuinely enjoy that field, but I'm afraid the admissions board will think that I'm a typical pre-med student. Uh, what do you advise to get past this? Oh, um, I don't know the answer to that. And I don't want to try to outthink the admissions committee. You know, medical school admissions are hard. Not everybody gets in. There's lots of you know, everybody's different. I don't know that I have any specific advice. I think it's really important to do stuff you like. And, you know, if you feel like you're, and I'm not at all impugning, um, wow, good job for the open captioning, spelling impugning, right? Um, 
it, I'm not at all impugning biology majors. I think they're great. Um, it wasn't the right fit for me. I think there are other ways to show diverse experiences. I do think it's important to have experiences outside of a sort of typical pre-med college experience. And maybe that's, you know, playing some weird instrument or volunteering, doing something unusual or, you know, finding other ways to kind of broaden your scope. Um, but those are my sort of off the cuff thoughts. I mean, I think that probably a lot of people have written a lot of stuff about getting into medical school. And I acknowledge that's not totally my area of expertise. Thank you. So in your opinion, will telemedicine help with co the COVID spread? If instead the physical, instead of physically going to the doctor's office, when you show symptoms, you can just have a Zoom call instead. Do you think um, that it's better? So I think better depends. I think telemedicine is great for the right people and the right diseases at the right time. It's not the be all and end all any more than penicillin is the be all and end all. It treats some patients for some diseases <clears throat> sometimes. Um, what we do here is yes, if you have COVID symptoms, we generally don't want you coming here unless you're in real respiratory distress. We generally want to do a video visit either our primary care docs do video visits. We have a different setup that is the emergency room docs doing video visits. And we wanna see you by video. And if you have mild symptoms, we have a way of getting you testing. If you have um, symptoms and you're a high risk person, you would qualify for one of the new medications. We have ways of getting you connected to that. If you have worse symptoms, then we triage you into the, um, into the emergency room or to urgent care. We actually have a roving ambula uh, ambulance thing that does, we'll, the ambulance will go and do telemedicine. Um, and so do I think telemedicine will help? Help? Yes, I think telemedicine helps with that. I think it helps with, with medicine in general because I have lots of patients. I mean, I saw somebody this morning, excuse me, who was on an antidepressant or something and you know, there was no need for him to come here. There was nothing um, that we would have done in person that we couldn't have done by video. And for some people on, you know, with depression or anxiety, it's triggering to come here. And for everybody, it's a pain to have to get here and go through the, we have a, you know, thermometer thing at the front door and you have to wait in the waiting room and you get all these like vital signs taken when really none of that is necessary. And so I think telemedicine is great for lots of different kinds of people. It's great for our doctors, frankly, too, who can, you know, do a video visit. I do a video visits from my administrative office all the time. It saves me running down the street to the ambulatory care center. I do video visits from home sometimes. Um, sometimes it's just better, but it's not the be all and end all, clearly. Thank you. Um, what leadership skills do you think you learned with having a joint business and medical degree rather than just a medical degree? I mean, I think I learned a lot of business skills that I use every single day. Um, you know, some of it is from the formal classes and some of it is from some of the sort of team projects and stuff that you do in the course of business school. I mean, we took a class in public speaking. We never got one of those in medical school. And, you know, all the time I'm speaking to hundreds of people. And so there are absolutely skills that are in business school that are really important and that are really relevant to every doctor's life. I mean, certainly as a, you know, as a second year resident, so not that many years past where you are, as a second year resident, you're often running a team that has a couple of interns, a couple of med students, maybe a visiting intern, you're managing up to the attending. It's all business skills around teamwork and leadership and delegation and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, but they don't really teach you how to do that in medical school or even in residency completely. So I do think there are lots of skills that you learn in business school that are really useful to doctors. I don't think that every doctor needs an MBA. I think there are lots of other ways 
to get those skills. I just think that people need to be attentive to what those skills are so they can go and pursue them. And there are lots of one-off courses or training, training in this or that that make people better leaders. Um, but I firmly believe that, you know, not all of being a doctor is like getting an A on your biochemistry exam or getting honors in, you know, first year anatomy. There's a lot of other skills that you need. There's a lot of humanistic skills that you need. There's a lot of leadership skills that you need because people see you as a leader, you know, whether you're the chair of medicine or you're the second year resident running a team or you're like a doctor in solo practice somewhere, people turn to you for advice or you're the, you know, doctor getting interviewed on TV in COVID. Um, people, COVID incidentally is not programmed into the um, closed captioning thing. Um, people turn to you as a leader and, you know, some of those leadership skills are important, but there are lots and lots of ways to get them. Thank you. Um, so how were you able to keep a good work-life balance in your career and throughout medical school? So it is a great question. Um, it was definitely harder in medical school and in a combined medicine business um, school, but I think it's easier now. Um, and it was frustrating when I was in, when I was in medical school, um, many of my friends from college, it was during the time of, there was like a big internet boom. Um, so this is like around 97. And so there was a big internet boom and a lot of my friends were making a killing in, in the internet business. And that's a thing. And it was really frustrating to be spending all night studying for stupid exams on useless anatomy um, when my friends were making tons of money and, and then had the weekends off or whatever. Um, that was tough. Um, but you gotta, you gotta love what you're doing. You know, you gotta go into it for the right reasons and you gotta love what you're doing and you gotta find ways to make even the um, tough times palatable and you gotta reward yourself like you studied all night tonight, but then next weekend you gotta take some time off or, you know, whatever. Um, I think internship and residency are hard. Um, no question, they're emotionally hard, they're physically hard, the hours are long. One of the reasons I came to New York was because at the time, um, there were work hour restrictions in New York, 80 hours a week and 27 hours in a row because of this old court case called the Bell Commission. Um, now those uh, work hour rules are true for residents everywhere in the country. And I think people are much more sensitive to not having residents do stuff that is a waste of time and really focusing on stuff that is core to patient care and to their education. And hospitals have just built in an infrastructure. You know, there was a day and a time and a place where residents were drawing blood and medical students were drawing blood on all the patients every day. And pretty soon, um, it turned out that, you know, I think people realized that that was a kind of waste of time, like it's educational the first few times, and then it's just a time sink. And so I think hospitals and, and residency programs and the ACGME that accredits residency programs has put a lot of focus into trying to create, you know, to reduce that burden, but it's still hard and medicine is hard. I mean, I'm fortunate that I have a job where my hours are pretty flexible and I work a lot, but you know, if I need to leave early to see my kids, you know, school play or something, or I need to come in late to go to the dentist appointment, like I'm fortunate that I have a job where I can do that. And I, you know, I dare say that most doctors end up in a job where they can do that. Um, but I also work hard and I also work on the weekends and I also work at night and I get calls from patients, not when it's the most convenient. And as you can see, like I'm giving a lecture and my thing is buzzing a hundred times and it's gonna be, you know, 5.30 when we're done and I'm gonna have 50 emails to, to return. So 
it's never easy. It's never going to be easy. I think the key is to find the things that are uh, personally rewarding and make sure you can, somebody else is texting me, um, and make sure you can do those things to have a job that you like to, um, you know, everybody's got stuff in their job that they like to do and stuff in their job that they have to do and figure out how you can, um, you know, tolerate that you make sure you pick a job where the stuff that you have to do in that job is tolerable, um, you know, and to make sure you make time for yourself to do all of those other things that are um, outside, you know, that keep you going exercise and friendships and relationships and eating well and sleeping well and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and that you work for an organization that values that. I mean, we, um, we've had a chief wellness officer at, um, at Sinai for about five years, whose job is to make everybody's life smoother. Believe me, it's not all peaches and cream, but, um, you know, I get that the, I get that the organization is trying and it's stuff that we think about a lot. And, you know, and as a leader, I've tried to do a lot of that stuff too. I used to, I used to send a lot of emails at 10 o'clock at night because that's when, you know, my kids would go to bed and the house would be quiet and I could sit down and focus for a couple of hours. And that worked really well for me, but come to find out that my teams often felt like they were expected, even though I told them absolutely do not respond at 10 o'clock at night, they would feel like this was hanging over their head if they didn't respond to it. And so I stopped sending emails at 10 o'clock at night or, you know, on Saturday night or whatever. And we're all learning. That was a really long winded answer. And, and there's no answer. People are, I, I cut all my burnout slides from this talk, but, you know, I could give you a whole talk on burnout and it stinks and there's lots of it and, and you got to find support. Um, you know, we got to fund mental health care. We got to demystify it or destigmatize it. I could go on and on. Rose, ask me another question because I can. <laughs> so uh, you talked in your presentation a bit about, um, you know, finding your network and maybe uh, reaching out to mentors. Do you have any specific LinkedIn tips for undergrads looking to build their network? Um, so I would say um, first thing is to build a great LinkedIn profile. And there are lots of websites online that, that will tell you how to do that. I think it's great to just start networking with people, network with each other, frankly, um, network with Nina and Rose, um, network with your college TAs or your professors or your classmates or the, I don't know, anybody, the registrar, the bursar, like whoever, all those people can be meaningful connections and where people are right now, um, you know, has, has little to do with where they will be someday. And it's just important to know a lot of people. I had a summer job once um, where my boss said like, whatever you do, don't ever throw away a phone number. And that was before the days of smartphones and, and, uh, LinkedIn and stuff. And so you actually had to keep like a list, of, you know, a word document or whatever. I don't know, remember what we did with um, with phone numbers in it. And I still have that word document um, now imported onto my phone because, you know, someday you'll remember something and you want somebody knows the answer to that and you want to be able to connect to them um, from the LinkedIn point of view. So I do your your LinkedIn connections and all your networking stuff matures with you over time, right? Five years from now, you know, all of you might be medical students or might be medical school graduates or whatever. 10 years from now, you might all be doctors in different practices all around the world. And you might have some connection to each other and be able to call on each other for help or advice or whatever. Um, I do think, you know, and then as you start building those sort of first degree relationships with your, you know, college professors, you'll see people who are linked to them who are, you know, of potential interest to you. And I wouldn't just, you know, reach out to people blindly, but, you know, if your biochemistry professor is connected to a, 
you know, biochemistry PhD in New York and you think you're going to, you know, move to New York someday, like, why not send them a LinkedIn request and don't just send a generic one, but write like, hey, something. Hey, I, you know, I saw that you're in New York and, you know, I'd love to move to New York and get my, bio, you know, my biochemistry PhD. And I'm really interested in the Krebs cycle. And um, I heard that you were the expert in the Krebs cycle. You know, can we connect and someday maybe we could set up a phone call. I think patients will mostly, I mean, I think people will mostly say yes. Um, if you're, you know, sort of convincing and you're not, you know, I get LinkedIn requests all the time from people who want to sell me stuff. Those I turn down. But if people can be, um, you know, if you can be compelling about why you want to help, I think most people out there, especially professors, doctors, like they want to help people. Um, so I do think that's useful. I said patients before, because I was thinking about how when we take med students around on the floors, med students are often afraid to ask patients like, can I listen to your heart? And one of the keys to being a good medical student is to do like a thousand heart exams so that by the end of medical school, you know what normal sounds like and what not normal sounds like. And, and I would say 95% of the time, the patients are like, sure, come on in. Let me tell you about my story. And they're so accommodating and more important than the like two heart exams I do with the med students in an afternoon is the like changing their mindset to um, it's okay to ask. And I feel that same way about LinkedIn. Um, you just, you kind of got to ask and maybe not everybody's going to say yes. And, you know, you got to be able to put a little effort into it and, and write a compelling note. And maybe I'm going to reject all of your LinkedIn requests this afternoon. But, but if you don't ask, you're not going to get it. And I, you know, so I'm very much of the school that, you know, what, what do you got to lose? So true. Um, so our next question is going to be, have you dealt with more mental health disorders since the start of this pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I think people are coming in more anxious and in New York, there's a fair amount of PTSD, I think. I mean, I'm sure there is in lots of parts of the country, but, you know, March and April, there were ambulances just going by. There were, you know, morgue trucks in the street. Um, and I think everybody is still a little stunned, I mean, me included, like everybody's still a little stunned by that. Um, so yes, I see tons of it, but I think, I think it's underappreciated how much mental health care happens in primary care, happens in medicine in general, outside of psychiatry. I remember about six or seven years ago, um, I had hired a new psychiatrist at the last place I worked. And so I, I told him to like spend the afternoon with me while I was seeing patients. And he was flabbergasted how much psychiatry, how much mental health care I was doing in primary care. Um, you know, and he would spend an hour with patients and just focus on psychiatry. And I was spending 15 minutes with patients and dealing with their diabetes, their anemia, their hypertension and their depression. And so I think there's not enough recognition of how much of that happens in, in primary care. Um, there's a, you know, there are a bunch of papers on like how many people in the emergency room or in other places have underlying mental health issues. And there's not enough support for that either. There's not enough mental health care out there. It's so hard. You know, I could get you, if you were having chest pain and you needed a catheterization, I could get you one today. And if you needed a psychiatrist, like I would call the chair and it would still be like a three month wait. And only if they took your insurance and whatever, you'd probably have to do a bunch of jump through a bunch of hoops first. It's, it's tough. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple more questions and then we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Um, what do you think about how the U.S. has managed and dealt with the COVID-19 pandemic? And do you think there needs to be more money deposited for ICUs to increase hotel um, hospital capacities? Man, I don't know how to answer that question. Um, I, I'm not a public policy guy. My, you know, my sense is that things are worse than we think they should have been. Um, but I don't know that I really know what the right public 
health or public policy things would have been. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna beg off that question. I think. I'm hopeful that people are doing the right stuff now, so that you know we have another second wave in New York now and in a lot of the country. Um, I assume we're gonna get another wave over the next few weeks, and I'm just hopeful that people are doing the right things to to try to minimize that. Thank you. Uh, so our last question is going to be, what are some things you wish you knew before starting med school? Um, so, I mean, I, I tried to cover a lot of the stuff that I wish I had known. I definitely wish I had known. So I, when I started college, I started as a biology major um, and ended up switching out of it. And so I wish at the beginning of college, I had known, I didn't even really know what economics was. And so I wish, um, I wish that I had known that there were lots of other options out there. Um, I certainly wish lots of people had told me, you asked about college or med school? Med school. So I think in med school, um, I'm sure people told me, but I, I wish more people had told me that it's not all about your chemistry grade and your biology grade in, in med school, that the preclinical years are important, but that being a good doctor is based on a lot of other stuff. Um, I, not because I, I didn't exactly figure it out, but it's easy to get, it's easy to get down when your science grades aren't perfect or whatever. Um, and it's easy to stress out over the cutaneous nerves of the hand. And you have to, I guess, but then you never, ever, ever use that again, unless you're like a neurosurgeon, in which case they're not going to rely on stuff that you learned in first year of medical school. Um, I, I definitely sort of stumbled on to the like, do a bunch of electives fourth year, and I wish I wish people had um, maybe more specifically told me that. I think the two best classes I took basically in med school, the two best rotations I did in med school were, um, were dermatology that I took as a fourth year elective and outpatient gynecology that I took as a fourth year elective because um, they were so different. There's no derm required in, at least in my med school and maybe in most. And so I got to see so much dermatology and I went to, internship and like knew more dermatology than almost anybody. And OBGYN as a resident was all about like delivering babies and doing these complicated surgeries. And there were like a million residents and stuff. And when I did this elective in this guy's office, like we just did pap smears all day. And I learned so much about doing good pap smears. And then we'd go to the operating room at this little community hospital and I'd be his like first assistant. And I learned so much about surgery different than what I learned in, you know, in my core surgery and GYN rotations. But you know, it was just an interesting way to talk about like what private practice was. And it's all those little experiences. I mean, yes, I learned a lot about gynecology, but I also, you know, just got to talk to somebody about medicine and private practice and what he wished he knew. And it's all these like little experiences that, um, that I found really, really useful. Um, and, you know, and I think I think medical school, especially being a third year, but even a fourth year medical student, and I think this sort of comes back to the theme of this talk, there is sort of no better time in life to ask a bunch of questions than when you're a third year medical student, because you've got a bunch of knowledge, but you're ultimately there to learn. And and it's much harder, it's much more intimidating to ask questions when you're an intern, when you're a resident, when you're the attending, when you're the chair of medicine, people look at you funny when you're like, I don't know how to do this thing. And it shouldn't. And, and you know, building confidence and asking questions is an important life skill. But when you're a third year medical student, they don't expect you to know stuff. And if you sort of fake knowing stuff, because you're sort of built to like fake knowing stuff, um, it, it comes back to bite you later. And I would argue, um, you should take the opportunity as a third year medical student to ask as many questions of as many people as you can. And 
you know, and that's part of what I'm saying today is to like explore stuff and learn about things and think outside the box and and connect with people outside of your domain and find ways to um, to learn about what's out there. Because I think all those things, I mean, maybe they'll help you get into medical school, but I certainly think they'll all make you a better doctor. Um, and, and to me, that's what it's all about. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, right now, we're just going to ask, do you have any final last minute advice for pre-health students? Oh my God, that was my final last minute advice. <laughs> um, no, don't worry. It all, you know, um, somehow it will work out. It doesn't seem like it's gonna, but you know, all these doors are weird things and people, you know, they, um, they don't get into med school. They don't get into an American medical school. They go into DO school. They, you know, take a bunch of years off. Like they're all different paths and they all sort of end up at the same place. So, I guess, I guess my advice is, and easy for me to say maybe, but, um, but you know, it's important to, to not put too much emphasis on what's not working and to think about sort of all the possibilities. Um, I think about, um, I'm gonna go off on another tangent, so you'll have to bear with me for 60 more seconds. Um, I'm not going to remember the name of this guy, but there was about 10 years ago, maybe longer. You, somebody can fill me in if you know the answer to this. Um, there, some school set up this uh, last lecture series. Does this sound familiar to people where professors, college professors were asked, like, if this were the last lecture you ever gave, um, what would it be about? And I think the first or one of the first last lectures was actually given by somebody who at some point in this process was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and ended up dying. And so it like literally was just about his last lecture. And he talked a lot about these kinds of things. He talked about all the kinds of things that um, he wished he knew early on in life as he was sort of moving up the academic ladder. And, and he, one of the things he says, he talks about brick walls and he talks about all these times where you think you're like chugging ahead and and then you just run into some impenetrable obstacle. And, and his point is like not to get discouraged by like, it's easy to get discouraged by stuff like that. But the skillful thing is you need to be able to figure out how to get around that. Like don't get discouraged by that, but find a way to go up or around or wait until the brick wall moves or something so that you can go on your path. And I think that's what Sheryl Sandberg is saying with the jungle gym too. It's like the right path is not always this way, you know, it goes in all different ways and you gotta be comfortable enough with the, with the process to sort of roll with it when it takes a kind of meandering way. Now I'm out of thoughts, so you gotta call it. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Weissman. That was an amazing presentation. We're so honored to get this time to really speak to you and um, gain all of this helpful insight that'll help us um, on our journeys. For all of my students, um, please be sure that you are reflecting on today's um, presentation. Uh, this is a great thing to keep track of when you are applying to different programs in the future. So you're not doing this for no reason. You're not doing this to rack up hours. You're doing this to gain experience and to gain insight into different fields. And so keep that in mind. Why did you join us today? What inspired you or motivated you? What part of today's presentation resonated with you? What are you gonna take away? from this presentation and keep with you as you move on in your journey. So this is for yourself. You don't have to share this with anybody. I encourage you all to keep a um, folder or keep a notebook just full of reflections and these will really be beneficial for you uh, in the future. If you guys stick around, I will be covering how to take the post shadowing assessment to get your certificate that verifies your virtual shadowing hours today. I am asking all of you on this Zoom call today to please share this link with five people. This is going to help us keep our program afloat. Like I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, this is a nonprofit program. We are student-led and we are running solely off of donations. 
So we have been experiencing some website crashes recently due to the high influx of students. And we welcome you all to pre-health shadowing and would love to continue putting on these great um, shadowing um, sessions for you all. And so we please ask that you share this link um, if you're not financially able to donate at this time. You can actually get volunteering hours for this. So if you have 15 shares, you are eligible for one hour of volunteering. And I will cover how to become a volunteer in the next few slides. My first announcement is we are taking applications to join our student team. This is a 100% remote opportunity where you get the chance to meet with like-minded students and gain professional professionalism and different skills that will uh, suit you in your future endeavors. Something that our speaker today, Dr. Wiseman, talked about was uh, how he majored in economics and how those skills have helped him in his job today. And so joining pre-health shadowing, you may be in um, a marketing focus group. You may be in a business focus group, a program planning focus group, an outreach focus group. And so just gaining these different skills that aren't, um, can I balance my chemical equation? Those are really gonna suit you uh, in the future and they're super important. So if you guys are interested, you can apply using this QR code and you can actually join us on our website. I recommend doing this from a computer since the application is a little bit long. Um, and you can find this on our website under the contact tab. We understand you are all pre-health students and may not have the time to commit to the student team. So we have volunteer opportunities open for you all. And this is a great way to still help out where you wanna help out on your own schedule for as many or as little hours as you are able to. If the only time you have is at two in the morning, you are more than welcome to help send us emails at two in the morning. So this is also on our website. You can find this under the contact tab as well as this QR code. Be sure to tag us in your social media posts at prehealth shadowing and use the hashtag prehealth shadowing. You can get reposted on the official prehealth shadowing account on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Just so you guys know, our program is not a secret. We are actually trying to let every pre-health student in the world know about pre-health shadowing so that everybody has the opportunity to enhance their journey. And COVID has affected people in different ways. And so we're just trying to make the change that we wanna be in the future. So be a part of this change, spread the word, help us raise money. Um, we are asking for your help. So thank you all. Our upcoming shadowing sessions, we have a double header this Thursday, as well as a shadowing session next week. So you guys can sign up for these on our website, www.prehealthshadowing.com. And now to get your certificate that verifies your virtual shadowing hours. Because we do have a lot of students in our Zoom today, I do recommend that if you are able to maybe delay your quiz by maybe 15 minutes, maybe 20, maybe 30, it will increase the chances of our website not crashing. Uh, so what you're gonna do to get your certificate is go find Dr. Wiseman in our all shadowing sessions. You're gonna click free, take this course once you get to his profile. You will have 30 minutes to complete the assessment and you will have two tries to get over 70%. Once you achieve a 70%, whether you get a 70 or a 100, I recommend that you download your certificate immediately before retrying because if you happen to not pass the second time and you pass the first time your eligibility will go away so once you get your certificate please download it and you are able to download your certificate immediately and you can also find it at all times in your profile under the certificates tab if you have any questions or experience any issues with this feel free to email us at info at prehealthshadowing.com and we will be sure to assist you. Thank you all for joining us today and I look forward to seeing you this Thursday. I invite you to disconnect from the Zoom. Thank you.